the right now I see Dr. Dave so we can get into the conversation and we're really going to get into the pain. And remember, I told you before that if you want to ask a question, please go right ahead and do so. Good evening, Doc. How you doing? Know? Evening. How are you doing, Shelly? I'm fine, thanks. I'm thanks doing for quite well. Me. Thank Sorry you for being me. here. No, no man, I understand. You know, that is why you, you do what you do. You have to make adjustments when you get the call. Babies move on their own time. I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, looking, I'm looking at your braids. You went and got your braids. Them sort out, man. You have, to, you have to touch it up, you know. You have to touch it up. Not even a strand out of place, man. <laughs> I have to touch it up. I have to touch it up. It needed a fresh up. We have no problems with this. It looks good. Big up your hairdresser. <laughs> no, 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 no hairdresser, hairstylist, hairstylist. No oh, hairdresser. Oh, all right. Pick up the hairstylist. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was just talking a little bit about my personal experience with pain. Um, I've been telling the story for years now about my own experience in uterine fibroids and all of that. But I just want you to, to kind of give us an overview on some of the things that could be causing pain because I've been stressing the fact that and, um, a lot of us go through pain and we accept that pain is supposed to be a part of our life when really pain is an indication that something is wrong. So I just want you to just kind of let us know, break it down and, and indicate what are some of the things that could be causing so many of us to be in such chronic pain, especially when it comes time for us to go through our periods. Okay, no problem. Um, you, you brought up a very good point. And um, when, when women have pain, because contrary to popular belief, your periods are not really supposed to be painful. But as you have alluded many times in your book and in your seminars, that, that um, it's, we are brought up in a society to believe that pain is normal. Chuck, I had the pain. You have the pain. Your auntie have the pain. It's normal. It's part of being a woman, right? Not necessarily Jamaica, but the Caribbean and a whole, especially, you know? So women are brainwashed. So like when I tell patients that, look, your periods are not supposed to be painful, they're shocked. Yes. They're shocked. <laughs> because they know nothing else other than pain. But, but ladies, I'm here to acknowledge and to educate that that is not necessarily so. So the medical terminology for painful periods are called dysmenorrhea, right? You know, mm. doctors have to have fancy names for everything. Yes, yes. So it can sound really smart. Yeah, man, so you can start so intelligent. So <laughs> this menorrhea can either be primary or secondary, okay? So primary dysmenorrhea or primary painful periods usually occur with the onset of menses, right? It's usually not that bad. And um, pain tends to occur usually about one or two days before the period. And usually day two to three of the period, it gets better, right? Right. Secondary dysmenorrhea usually means that there's a cause, and that's the one women normally have. So primary, we can't really find a cause, but secondary mm -hmm. is a cause, right? So normally there are some, some, some molecules called prostaglandins, which basically they are inflammatory mediators, or they control inflammation. So when you're seeing a your period with primary dysmenorrhea, essentially these prostaglandins are activated and cause the uterus to contract and push the blood out. Right, so mm. the pain that you're feeling is actually the uterus contracting, almost similar to when you're having in labor, but on a much, much lower, lower scale. And it's actually, I've heard, blood. I've heard some doctors explain that some of what women feel is similar to the pain that we would actually feel if we we're going through labor. That's true. That's true. That's true. So, but, but not on that level, you know. Mm. But the primary dysmenorrhea, the prostaglandins are activated and it causes the uterus to contract, right? So a lot of the time, mm -hmm. we're not going to find a cause for that. But for the secondary dysmenorrhea now, that is when there's usually a cause. And the right. main cause is endometriosis. We're going to touch on that. The second right. cause is usually fibroids or adenomyosis. Mm -hmm. And the third one is some kind of pelvic infection. And at the bottom mm -hmm. of the list is probably like some scar tissue from a previous surgery you may have had. But common things are common. So essentially what this endometriosis is, is the cells that line the womb. That's called the endometrium. They're found outside of the womb. And right. they the same way. So just as you're seeing your period and coming through the vagina, you're seeing your period on the inside. And these cells are usually found behind the uterus, behind the vagina. But sometimes they can be even as far as the, the lung, or the brain, yes, heard, or even in the belly button, 
you know it can and even sometimes it can even be in the c section foot you know mm. or whatever it can be anywhere but it's usually confined to the pelvis and so just like your senior men's you'll be seeing your men's on the inside so you'll be bleeding on the inside and that's this bleeding causes scar tissue and when right. you see the period the scar tissue becomes inflamed and the pain is just elevated so one mm -hmm. in ten women actually have have um have endometriosis and the thing is it's, it's a hard diagnosis to make because it's not like ultrasound can show it or or mri can show it you really have to go off of the clinical presentation of the patient because right. the only way we can confirm it is if we operate on you remove it and send it to the lab and the lab say hey this is endometrial deposits and that's a, it's oh. a, it's a tricky it's a tricky it's a tricky oh, you know, that, that, that clears up a lot of things for me just now you know because everybody who i hear have endometriosis they tell a story of how how much run around they got before they were actually diagnosed Definitely. so that that explains it definitely so you brought up a very good point shelly the average time of diagnosing endometriosis is 10 years yes because patients i've heard that story because patients bounce from doctors to doctors and even some doctors mm. are, are, are are at fault because some doctors say yeah man that's normal painful period is normal take two right. take two advil you're all right right because yes, like some doctors actually undermine it as well but yeah that level of pain because i mean any any time all right ladies anytime the period is letting you not function or not yes. perform your daily activities that is wrong you're out of work you know that you can't go to school you can't go to work for two three days because it appeared that is not normal that is not normal at all agree shelly of course of that's course i'm not there god god i make... think there yeah man so women women are god made women stronger than men but he did not make women that strong to suffer all the time every month because that's not normal right yeah so endometriosis is one the second one as you know is fibroids right Five. So fibroids, abnormal growth of the musculature of the womb, and they usually present with painful periods and mm -hmm. heavy, painful Very and heavy, heavy periods. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And I heard when I came on, you mentioned anemia. So that yes. is when you, you bleed out and your blood comes. I suffered very, very... anemia for most of my adult life. I mean, I've, I've actually blocked out. I can remember three particular instances where I've lost consciousness because my blood count was so low. One of them, there was an ambulance there and the EMT was like, Miss, seriously, you're not even supposed to be alive. <laughs> and I, I bleed very, like, that back in the day, I used to bleed so heavy, I would have to wear an overnight extra long pad plus a tampon. And that you lasts suffer, for like an hour. You suffer. And I mean, you suffer. end to end, full. You suffer. Yeah, man. That's where I'm coming from. That's not normal. So ladies, that's not normal. So we said painful periods and heavy painful and heavy mm -hmm. periods, not mm -hmm. normal. And yeah. the third thing at the bottom of the list after so adenomyosis, that's basically endometriosis in the muscle of the womb. Right. So it's at the same way, it's at the same way as fibroids. It prevents the uterus. So how, the reason you get the heavy bleeding in fibroids, the uterus is not contracting pro properly because the fibroids are preventing the muscles from contracting. Right. So mm -hmm. as a result, if the muscles can't contract to stop the bleeding, you're just going to keep on bleeding. On bleeding. You're just going to keep... So that is how fibroids cause the prolonged bleeding. And then the last one now is like a history of a chronic pelvic infection, usually secondary to sexually transmitted disease. Right. Which a lot of times in this day and age, most people don't have any signs or symptoms. So you'll have mm -hmm. this pain all the time. You don't know why the pain is causing the pain. You have difficulties getting pregnant, and then when you go to the doctor, and the doctor does the proper assessment, laparoscopy, you find out that you have a history of um, STIs that has right. permanently scarred the pelvis. And we'll have to try and remove as, as much of it as possible. And while yeah. we're on this topic, I want to just talk about the fact that a lot of women don't get treated for STIs because she, she, she feels a little way. You know, she is like, oh, you know, my gosh, I can't believe I was so careless. And, blah, blah, blah. and so, this, this, this stigma around getting treatment for certain things um, because somehow she feel like she's easy and she's loose and all the other judgments that come with that. And um, I bring that up because I get that feedback from women. And when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm doing like a seminar or something and I, and I say, look here, 
the if you don't treat your STD, it can develop into um, PID, which is pelvic inflammatory disease, which can affect your fertility and cause all sorts of other problems on in the long run. So you have to treat it. You can't just say, all right, you just go, go and take two pills or, or do a thing or go douche because it seems like everything, I'm going to just douche it out and think that deals with it. And, and, and that is so important to point out because just because you feel a little embarrassed, do it anyway. Embarrassment don't kill nobody. Of course. You, you, another good point you brought up, Shelley, because that's something I'm very, I'm passionate about, about three things mainly in, in this field. I'm passionate about cervical cancer and awareness. That's one. Yes. I'm passionate about pain, the whole topic yeah. of pelvic pain. And I'm passionate yes. about sexually transmitted infections slash diseases and awareness. And I'm going yes. to tell a little story. I've told this story so many times. I think I told it in a live, but I'm going to say it again. When I was in medical school in the early 2000s, and we had to rotate through community health. Yes. Are you familiar with Comprehensive Health Center, Shelley? No. That's on Skype. Oh, see. Okay, so Comprehensive Health Center is one of the largest health centers in Jamaica. It's, it's, mm. it's on the same road as KPH. Okay. And it's, it has a section, the type 3, that have a section of the clinic that is just dedicated to sexually transmitted diseases, right? Mm. So when we were in medical school, they gave us this big book, thick book, about 300 pages on everything about sexually transmitted infections and diseases. Every disease under the sun, every picture how it classically present. And trust me, you had to, if, you, if you read that book, you'd be turned off from having sex. And if you read that book, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have every knowledge about every STI. Right? right? So this was in the early 2000s. So now in 2020, that book is just a history piece. Yeah. Because I can count on one hand every year. Hear what I say now? Every year, mm -hmm. I can count on one hand how many times I classically diagnose or tell or find out that a person has a sexually transmitted infection from just examining them and looking at them. The point right. of the matter is most STIs in 2020 look the same, normal. Mm -hmm. Normal, yeah, right, and you're not going to find something if you're not looking for it. And I give a typical example. I remember a patient came to me, no problems, she just came for a checkup. What a discussion! And I screen all my patients every year, once a year, I screen a patient. And I was talking to her, let's just do your STI screen, you know, let's just make sure we'll see what's going on. And she said, Everything fine because she was shocked. I said, Yeah, man, you're fine, the exam was normal, you know, but let's just check it in. You know, a lot of times, things can be there, we're not too sure. And she came back positive for like three things. And wow. she broke down in the office. When I called her and she came to the office, she broke down because how is this possible? The same thing I mentioned a while ago. Does this mean I'm loose? I say no. And she didn't. This doesn't mean anything. It just means that we're not aware because people have this. Again, it boils down to our comfort level. People yes. go, like, okay, my partner don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I never seen discharge. I never seen a bump. I never seen a lump. I don't have no fever. I don't have no belly pain. I clean. My partner don't right. have a bump on him penis. I'm clean. Right. Mm -hmm. but, I'm yet to tell you that that is not the case. And the majority of my STIs that I diagnosed, because remember I said only one hand for the year, so that's five for the year, 12 months right. I diagnosed classically, looking at the patient, examining the patient, but the majority of my diagnoses are made from screening. So if I never mm. screen you, if I didn't screen you, or I didn't offer screening to you, you'd be walking up and down the place with this STI. It can damage your tubes, as you mentioned. Pelvic and you, and you don't even know. And you don't even know. You don't wow. know. You don't but you know, know. even because Miss God do a screen, you know, because well, I mean I recommend I recommend every year you get a screen. Yeah, I don't want to do I don't have to do every year. Monogam, regardless if you're in a monogamous relationship or not. Because people do step out. It doesn't have to be you. And they can yes. step out and they can bring something yeah. back home. Oh you yes, and you can catch things through oral stimulation to cause some people don't course, count I mean, oral most STIs. Most STIs most STIs can be transmitted orally as well. Yes. Now, some people don't most count STIs. oral stimulation. They just feel like as long as, as, long as it's not vaginally or, or anally penetrated, sex didn't happen. Yeah. So I like to That's show true. that to let you know that oral stimulation is a thing. Mo most men think like that, though. Yes, I, I know. Except me, except me, except me. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> no, most, me know most, most, men, most men think that way, that... If mm -hmm. um, they didn't penetrate, they never. If they was, and they well, never there cheated. you go, and then in the cheat. 
So if they get a little head, if they get a little head from some girl with two teeth from the place at the time when they did drink too much and it's and it be nice, it don't count. You're most men don't think <laughs> sorry, 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 men, but I'm keeping it real. <laughs> no, facts and truth facts and truth. It real. Yes, man, we're here to talk about that. All right. So now we know what causes pain. And and so all right, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, from a from a clinical standpoint, because I'm in the business of prevention, you know. I, I don't want to wait until we have the issues and the pain and all these kind of things before we start treating them. What can we do to, to, to prevent some of these things that 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 that, 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 that we experience or can it be prevented at all? Well, I think the main key in prevention is education. Yeah. So you're doing a good job. I make it my duty to educate as well. I think ignorance is bliss and ignorance is rampant in Jamaica. And it's no, oh, it's, no, it's, no it's no fault of ours. It's just how the economy and how our, our, our mentality and how we're brought up. So, so a lot of times when I'm talking to patients, it's like, oh my God, I didn't know that. You know, yeah. I, I, I take a lot of pride in, in educating people and letting women be aware of their bodies and aware of what is happening. So, I mean, the, the common things, I mean, in terms of education, I mean, mothers, if you have your daughters who are having painful periods, they need to be assessed. That's the yes. thing. Don't watch it. Don't let them go through Don't, the don't just give her some tablet and say, go on, go on. Definitely not. Exactly. Let them be assessed. Let, let, let us find a possible cause. Let us find a possible yes. treatment. As I mentioned before, a lot of the times we're not going to find a cause. Some patients or some mothers may not be averse to having their young children having the surgery. So, but there are some mechanisms we can do to shut down the ovaries yeah. temporarily to give her some, some kind of semi-permanent, or sorry, semi-relief. semi, semi -relief. Right, you know? right, right, so, right. So that is one, so education and, 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 and um, identification. The other thing is practice safe sex. Yes. You know, I mean, it's, yes. it's so cliche. It's so cliche, but I mean, most women and most couples do not practice safe sex even if it's the first time the meeting of a partner it's just oh god i don't know why it is you can't so... say the word careless careless is a one of careless careless, careless life careless, and one of the careless careless careless, careless, careless. but the bit and, and again <laughs> the problem is that all people care about you know and you can probably allude to this and agree with me is that your hiv good that's all i'm going to know yes yes no, it's true. As long as HIV good, and not just that, but even in the in the conversation around safe sex, one of the things that I tell people all the time is like, just wearing a condom is not enough. Condom only covers the penis. Everything else is still accessible, yeah, especially if you are going to do oral stimulation. You do the oral stimulation, then you put on the condom. Yeah, true, <laughs> but and a lot of a lot of STIs like the the, the HPV, especially yes. the herpes. As you mentioned, the, the, the condom is just covering the penis. All it's just covering the penis. Have those viruses. And, once, and, and especially those two that I mentioned, they are transferred from skin to skin contact. Yep. So if the, if the pelvis, rubbing up the pelvis, if the testicles touching the vulva and, and the virus is present on that skin, remember, a lot of times you don't have to have any physical evidence for the virus to be there. So All right. even sex without condom, people don't understand this, even sex without condom, you still can get diseases. A condom only covers the penis. I say, I, and when I say it, people look at me and they roll their eyes like, but them say I must wear a condom. I say, yes, but you also have to go a little further. Like for me, I mean, I'm not a prude. I am, I am very adventurous and all of that. But I think that you must put some sort of thought to who you decide to share your body with. Because sharing your body is a big deal. And, and, and the consequences can be long term and they can be very, very 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 hard on you and at the end of the day you want to be able to still move on from this experience that you have had whether you're together with a person or not so that is what that is the reason why i i, I use to justify getting to know more about the person and I, i'm very dry yeah you know i think i'm getting worse with age it's going to get better with age i get worse with age because my thing is if you are unwilling to get checked out for certain things you don't get to touch none of this and you want to touch some of this because it's amazing. But mm -hmm. you, in order to do it, you have to pay the toll. And that's just, the, that's just what it is. And if we, don't, if we don't take that kind of approach, what are we opening ourselves to? Definitely. I agree with you. I always encourage couples before they have sex 
to do a baseline STI to see what the two of you are. Do it. Both of them go together and do it. I, that, I yeah, said that do all it. the do, time. I mean, do, I mean, just see where you are. Just see where you yeah. are. Just see mm -hmm. where you are. So you know whether or not you want to decide to go into a relationship knowing X, Y, Z is there, or we know we're both negative, and if anything pops up in the future, we know somebody that is to blame. Go and stop not a road. Exactly. There you go. So I mean, mm -hmm. that's the right thing to do, you know? But 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 definitely education is a big part of practice safe sex. Um, for all the ladies, don't suffer in the pain, right? Yes. Please go to your doctor, let the doctor properly assess you. Do your reading as well. I mean, I find in this day and age, women are much more equipped when they go to the doctor. I mean, you have to be on your P's and Q's because these ladies are coming sharp. Yeah, man, they're coming. Sharp. Them sharp. Them, they, them, have, them have a book and them have the page yeah. mark. Say, so, okay, so... On page 17, it says. <laughs> no, man, you, have to, you have to be on your P's and Q's and just educate yourself and just be aware. I mean, the most common thing for the STIs, though, how women will present. present. They will come like they're trying to get pregnant for, for years. Yes. And then when you evaluate the tubes, you realize the tubes are occluded. And there, there, there are two things that cause the tubes to be occluded. A history of STI, pelvic in inflammatory disease, or endometriosis. Right. Mm. So most times, most STIs are subclinical, meaning that you don't have any clinical evidence or clinical signs or symptoms. So right. by the time, and then remember, it's a gradual process. So the infections keep on going, and the tubes are very delicate structures. So it's keep on going and keep on going. No matter, and you can have sex with one person in your life, and you can yes. get somebody and gonorrhea, and that's the end of your fertility career. Look at that. That's the end. If the tubes are gone. Because people always say, but doc, how this time I only had sex with three people in my life. I finally meet my husband. We've been together for two years. I say, it's just one of these things that happen. And then, you know, but how this other lady have 11 babies and why my luck have to be so bad? And it's, 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 yeah. it's unfortunate. You know, it's really unfortunate. They have to be vigilant. This is when, this is when empathy and, and uh, you really have to be empathetic and, and, and show care for the patient. Because... They, they look at, and they feel bad. They say, oh my God, I, what did I do to myself? Is that, that, is that dirty boy we sleep with enough? I him mess it up enough. Really? They find everything to try and blame. Yeah. I mean, I have had yeah. patients before and they say, like they have an STI and they say, is him give it to me enough? They, they can have six partners in them life. Is that one yeah. of the partner number two? You know, he was the dirtiest one. And you, you'd never know it could be the last one that give it to you. You just never no, know. No, but that, is, that is don't mean anything. Wait, what does it mean? Some of the dirty people can be the cleanest ones too. I can be exactly. Cleanest, you know? What yeah. what is dirty? <laughs> that is okay. the terminology the ladies like to use, Shelley. No, but I am I'm, I'm familiar with it. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I know you are. What I'm been that's I've what been... them like to use all the time when they're trying to point the blame. <laughs> when they're trying to point yeah. the blame. Right. Okay. So let us look at let us look at um endometriosis for a second. Uh, I spend a lot of time in schools. I'm talking to high school students. I'm talking to even primary school students who describe to me some pain that uh, when you see an a, a 11 year old girl, I describe a certain level of pain to you. It, it really, well, it makes me really cringe because I can relate to what she's saying. And at her tender age, for her to be going through that kind of pain, what can be done? from a medical standpoint, to help an 11-year-old girl who seems to be displaying, based on the pain that she described, symptoms of endometriosis. Because I know that a lot of parents are very hesitant to, to, to even have their kids checked out whenever they have pain. They just kind of teach them how to bear it, give them different kind of things to manage the pain and all of that. But the idea of taking them to the gynecologist to be examined is, is, is not even on the table because... They're not supposed to have any those type of issues at 11. But when I hear the description of the pain that this little girl is, is, is telling me, that's what it sounds like to me. How do we get parents to be in, 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 a, in, a, in a frame of mind where they can recognize it early and maybe try to approach some sort of maybe long-term treatment, maybe not surgery, but something that can give them child some relief and still protect them long enough so if they're interested in, 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 in having children in their childbearing age, they'll still be able to do that with their fertility intact. Okay. It, it, again, answering that question with the previous question you mentioned, um, it boils down to education and awareness. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. The treatment of endometriosis is multifaceted, but normally it's a stepwise manner. So 
once we suspect it a lot, we, we start with the basic things. So the, like, and it's normally three steps. I always tell patients it's three steps. So the first right. step is the basic over-the-counter painkillers, right? If that doesn't work, we probably have to get something a little stronger that re requires a prescription. So that's the first right. step. And the second step is hormonal medication. The easiest way to manipulate a cycle is with a contraceptive pill. And a lot of parents have a negative stigma attached to the pill. Why am I giving her the pill if she's not having sex? Um, I don't want to give her these hormones so early in life. But if you understand how endometriosis is happening and the, and the pathology of endometriosis, you can understand how the pill will come into place. So if you remember that, I mean, the pill basically is like a puppeteer and it controls the hormone levels. And um, it controls it in such a way that it can decrease the flow and decrease the pain of the cycle. And even there's a way you can even take the pill back to back, as some women will know. You're not going to see a period. Because the reason you get the period in it is because the pill has estrogen and progesterone. And the reason you get the period is because progesterone stops. So right. you get progesterone withdrawal and then the body starts to bleed or the uterus starts to bleed. So if you continue giving continuous progesterone, you're not going to bleed. So right. there's two ways how I approach that. I mean, you can put the patient, you can put the girl and the baby, the, the young, the young adolescent on the pill, right? Whether you do it continuous or you do it um, intermittent, but even on right. intermittent, the pain will be decreased by up to fifty percent, and you can combine it with some painkillers, right? But right. before all of this, the the, the 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 young the young girl needs to get assessed, you know, so right. you can ensure. I mean, sometimes it, it can be other things causing it, so we have to ensure there's nothing else that cause it and once we have a clear cut that it could be endometriosis we just try and increase her quality of life until she's ready to 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 to, to get surgery because the truth yeah. is you know surgery is, is is what helps to remove these deposits the best that's the reality of the situation but you can get some good i have some i'm thinking of some young girls right now i'm looking after who came to me with very bad pain and they're doing very well on the pill right now very very okay. well no, no, um, I, I asked that question on purpose just because I know that there are a lot of parents who, are, who, are, who don't even entertain the idea of, 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 of getting their child assessed. Like they, don't, they, don't, they don't even want that to happen at all because she's too young. And, and I've met, I've met um, last year when I, I went, I was in Trinidad for a few months and I met a young lady she was 17 and she had already done two endometriosis surgeries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess her parents were a little bit more progressive because I was very surprised to hear. She said she did the first one at 15 mm -hmm. because but you know, her case was really, really bad. But I'm, yeah. just imagine, I'm just imagining her having Jamaican parents and having that kind of symptom and, and knowing that her parents would not be interested in, in, in entertaining something like that at her, at her age. So I just wanted to ask because I know that younger and younger, and that's why it comes back to food, you know, that's why I, I talk so much about food because part of the problem is that a lot of what is being fed to our young people is very deficient nutritionally and our bodies are compensating for that. And that is why some of the issues that we are having is, 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 is manifest so early. Because we're just not feeding our bodies correctly nutritionally. We are lacking nutrition. Fully agree with you. Fully agree with you. Fully, fully agree with you. And, and diet, diet, there is a role in diet in controlling menstrual pain as well. Of course. Well, you know, I, that's my there life. There is a role, you know. <laughs> we we'll have to let the, the parents be more open to, look, there's nothing wrong with carrying your 13-year-old your 14 year old to the gynecologist never forget that we are the experts of the female body right yeah and it doesn't involve being a pelvic exam because a lot of time oh my god you have to examine them. I said no we just need to see them we can we can get a lot of information from just feeling the belly and talking to the patient and, and get yeah. more information but the patient need to be assessed you know yeah need and i always tell patients don't go to a regular doctor no offense to any general practitioner at all my brother is a general practitioner, one of the best general practitioners I know. But there's a reason we specialize in the female anatomy and physiology. Right. There's a reason why we do it, you know? So we can pick up things, we can identify problems, and we can treat them. Because the whole idea is once you pick up any problem and you treat it earlier, 
you can you can solve the problem quickly before you get any any long term complications. Of As course, I mentioned, endometriosis can impact your fertility. Yes, it can. Mm -hmm. And it can and and good. and a lot of women unfortunately don't realize that they have a pelvic issue until they're trying to have a child and and, and is unsuccessful. And that is why I, I asked about prevention because a lot of times it's too late when they finally figure out what the issue is. It's done gone bad already. Their tubes are gone. Then then whatever issue it is, it has been per it's permanent. And so any hopes they have of, of trying to have a child is gone through the door because of this chronic issue. And that's why I'm trying to figure out how can we address it from a lifestyle standpoint before it gets to a point where we are completely gone. And that's why that point that you made about that, that annual screening, as I come off of the phone and you may call my, my gynecologist and book one and say, listen, draw some blood and test out the thing, you know, because I want to know where I am. Because I'm not one of I don't want to know people. I want to know. <laughs> I, I, I encourage women to be in charge of the health. It's your body is one yes. thing you have. Be in charge, be in control. Don't wait. And I mean, it, 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 it kind of hurts me when I see like a, a, a young young adults in her mid twenties, never done a pap smear before and never done a yeah. test yet. Just coming because to me because she has a vaginal discharge. That's the reason she's coming to me. 25, 26, coming to me because she had a, a, a query yeast infection. And then I take that opportunity now to educate them on everything. HPV, yeah. contraception, um, STI screening. I mean, it's, it's, it's a window of opportunity. I'm have to jump on it because Women are not coming for checkups or women are not coming for their well woman visits. They're not doing it. In Jamaica, yeah. they're not doing it. They're not doing it. They're coming yeah. when something is wrong. When something and is we wrong. Know, we need to we need to clear that. We need to get over that. And, and you know, and you know, typically that's not, that's not I don't know when we started that, that attitude, you know, that used to be a man thing, you know, because you know it's a man created doctor. But women are usually very, very good about going to get checked and making sure they do the pap smear and the mammograms and stuff like that. So I didn't know I don't I didn't know that the numbers were falling where that is concerned because I cuss my male friends all the time. I say, listen, we're not supposed to be dying from prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is one of the most successfully treated cancers. If we catch it early, we can take out we need to take out and move on in the life, everything works fine. We're not supposed to be dying from prostate cancer. But because them spray the doctor, they wait until their pain is dead first before them start getting any kind of medical attention, which by then is too late. It's dead. It's too late. It's too late. Right? Prevention but is I think you know that women were having the same issue. So ladies, come, come, fix up for yourself. Prevention <laughs> is better than cure. In Jamaica, in Jamaica, the number two cancer that kills our women, I don't like to be morbid, but the number two cancer that kills our women is cancer of the cervix. Right? Oh, it's the God. number one gynecological cancer but it's a number two cancer overall after breast. And the majority of women, Professor Fletcher found this out, the majority of women in Jamaica who have cancer of the cervix have never done a pap smear. Never. Oh, wow. wow. Never, ever, ever. And by the time they get it, it's too late. It's too and late. When you, wow. when you look in America and England now, cancer of the cervix is at the bottom of the list, like number 10, number 11, number 12. And a big reason. And, and, is, and the exam is fairly, it's fairly easy to go to. I mean, it's much, yes. it's much easier than a mammogram. Like a mammogram is just a torture device. Whosoever invented that don't like women and breasts. Of course. Of but course. the cervical, the, the, the pap smear is not so bad. It's not that bad. And a, a lot of women come in there with a negative stigma that it's going to be painful, it's going to be uncomfortable. And, and, and again, they talk to them friends and say, I'm not going to get that. I'm not going to come to me. I say, I hear it hot. I hear it hot. I'm not going to go. So these are the reasons why women are not coming to get assessed, you know? And we need to change. But Dr. Daly, you say, you say you need to come on. You, need, you say you need to come on the road with me when we go into the colleges, though. Because we need to tell. We need to talk about. We we'll speak long, about. As long as my schedule is there. As long as my schedule is there. We speak about that after. Because that is so important, what you said just now. They need to know what it's about. But which is me and you, I have a pointer to help the, the whole, the whole um, thing a little bit more comfortable. The tool is a little bit more comfortable if it's not so cold. So please feel free to warm it up. The speculum, it's already very, it, it don't, there's nothing attractive about it. We are not aroused when we get into this place. It's usually cold in the room. It will be very good if you warm up the speculum. I beg you, please and thanks. And every lady in this, in this live right now who has ever done a pap smear can attest that the cold tools really, really just don't help. 
Warm up the tools, please. Warm up the tools. We can get around the tools tools. with a plastic speculum. <laughs> we, can, we can get around using the plastic ones. The plastic ones are not cold. Okay, well, all right, well, there you go. It's better <laughs> already, you see? Feedback from the clientele. <laughs> okay. Okay, 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 okay. All right, okay. so we have about 10 minutes to go because, you know, Instagram don't have my manners. I want you to take the 10 minutes to tell us something. Tell us something that you have observed in your practice. Tell us one thing that you think we're misinformed about, that you're making a mistake with, something that you wish we'll stop doing, and, or something that you wish you'd pay attention to that will help our pelvic health. HPV, awareness and treatment. That's the number one thing I'm passionate about. Um, again, ignorance. Um, HPV is very, very common. Human papilloma virus. It, it is the most common sexually transmitted infection. And actually, it's called it's a sexually transmitted disease. Because mm. a, a disease is one that can um, cause problems. So it's an STD because it can cause cancer of the cervix. Right? Mm. So, so HPV is, is very, very common. You have over 250 types of HPV subtypes, right? It is so common that one, one study stated that if you have had sex with two people in your lifetime, two, mm. you're guaranteed to get one of the 250 types, right? Oh. But, but mm. stick up in, most HPV causes no problem. The immune system fights it off. You get exposed to it, the immune system fights it off, and it goes away. And mm. most of the time, HPV have no signs or symptoms, no fever, no cough, no cold, nothing. So you're not going to know you even have it, right? But right. your body fights off. However, 30% of the time, the virus will just persist. So the immune system not fighting it off, but it's not causing any problem, and the virus just persisted. It just persisted. It just persisted, and, and it loves the cervix. So what will happen, it will just stay in the cervix and just marinate. Like it marinated meat, you know, it seasons some meat and you're waiting for it. It will just marinate. And after the average time is about 20, 24, 20 to 24 years before it turns wow. to cancer. It turns, I mean, you have, you have higher grade and you have low grade, but the average time is around 20, 24 years before it turns to cancer. So, and it, it doesn't go from normal to cancer, right? And I want my ladies to understand that it goes through a phase. It goes from normal to pre-cancer, to cancer. So the whole idea of doing a pap smear, you want to pick up these abnormal changes so you can prevent it from going to cancer, right? Because once we can prevent it from going to cancer, you're good. You're good. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is why we need to know about this HPV. We need to know about the vaccination. The vaccine is very, very important. Very important. I mean, we talk, the, the latest vaccine we're talking about is a COVID-19 vaccine. And when that come out, everybody can want to get it. But everybody forget about the HPV vaccine that we need to be getting right now. Right? I mean, the best time to get the vaccine... So when you do the screening, can you screen for the HPV? So like oh, when I'm going to oh, the doctor, for HPV, they, they can do that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. But, yeah, you can test for it too. You can do it tw at the same time. But it's a very mm -hmm. expensive test, right? So in, all, in America and the United, and United Kingdom, they do a dual test. So they do the pap smear. Because the same sample, yeah. the same sample can test for HPV and the pap smear. But in Jamaica, that's not possible. We have to, two, we have to send two different samples, right? So mm. I only do the HPV really in like, a, in, a, in a high clinically suspicious case or a complicated case. Because for the most part, you can, you can monitor the patient with pap smear screening and follow up. But I, have a I don't want to get too detailed. But, you know, if the, if, the, if the pap smear come back a little borderline and it's not clear cut, that is when, like, the HPV will come into place. Okay. You know? So there's, there's, okay. there's algorithms you can do, but if a patient insists, which I recommend everybody, and I recommend dual testing for everybody, but the reality is it's very expensive. I mean, for a pap smear and the HPV test, if you're paying cash, that's about $16,000 alone. That's not the doctor's fee. I see your face, makeup, Shelly. That's so. That is why you have to be very selective in the patients you offer the DNA for the HPV DNA testing. You know? well, you, well, you know what? I, I can I can I change my view on, on healthcare and all of this thing. You know, but <laughs> not only that still, man. Just yeah, guys, I just test that alone. But but I I I always say that 
healthy is always cheaper than sick. So if the if the test costs that, then the treatment will cost more. So oh, I, know, I suppose prevention is better and cheaper. Than yeah, man. Before. Yeah, man. They always say healthy is cheaper is than sick. And the vaccine is expensive too, but the vaccine is very good. The vaccine covers nine types of HPV. So even but didn't they didn't they have a price? Didn't they have a didn't they have a vaccine that the that the ministry was 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 um yeah, this at a point isn't. That program has ended. What's the yeah, status think, on I that? Think it, it wasn't well received by the Jamaican public. So. Because they didn't understand it, and I don't, I don't blame them for not understanding it. Because all of what you just said a while ago is the clearest explanation that I've gotten thus far where HPV is concerned. Mm -hmm. And 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 I've been to some of these 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 seminars where the person is trying to explain it, and all they do is confuse people further. It's and easy. I think they... that the rollout was just a little sloppy because. People just didn't understand what this HPV thing was. You're 100%. You're, you're it wasn't, again, the, the educational campaign probably wasn't as effective as it should have been. You right. And, and the one, just, just to wrap up this, the HPV vaccine, you have two on the market. You have one that covers two type of HPV, the bivalent. Right. And those are the ones that usually cause cancer, 16 and 18. And you have a new one on the market that covers nine. Mm. Right? So, 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 even though the promoted, the bivalent one is having cross coverage for a lot of the others, this one is definitely saying, okay, we're definitely covering this, right? So, even though you may or may not be exposed to some, you definitely will have coverage for the others. And to me, the HPV vaccine is a no brainer. I got the vaccine, I encourage it. Men can get it, women can get it up until the age of 45. It's a no brainer, right? And it's a no-brainer because you understand it, doctor. Yes. I'm just saying yes. that part of the issue that a lot of persons have. I, I listen. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I, I don't say I have a problem with vaccine. But even this whole conversation around the COVID vaccine, I don't have a problem with vaccine at all. I am very concerned that everybody is trying to race towards a vaccine because, from what I understand about the vaccination process, is just just to test the vaccine alone. There are some parts of it that you cannot rush. And then the process has to happen so that it is that it is effective and actually does what we want it to do. But I am not an anti vaxxer at all. And when I heard about the HPV vaccine, I wanted to get as much information as I possibly get to get. And I, I, have, I have attended, I can remember at least four of the different information sessions. And when I went to some of them, it's like, what are you talking about? This is, this is, and, and then even the presenter was trying to explain how many times they need to go, how many dosage. One of them said you had to get like six different injections at six different points. And he couldn't tell you how far between, like if you get it today, when you go and get the next one, he gave a range. And I just thought it was just, it just felt as if they were still trying to figure it out as well. So I really would like to know what the plan is as it relates to educating the public more about, about HPV because it is something that I am personally um, concerned about just because of how common it is and how, 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 how contagious it is. And so I really do think that some conversation really do need to happen to, to clarify a lot of the things because I didn't think that it was clear when, when the campaign rolled out. It wasn't clear. And to this day, it isn't clear. A lot of people are confused about it. You know? But unfortunately, we'll have this bigger thing to fight right now. So we can't look for that rollout anytime soon because they're going to put all their efforts into the COVID. So it really depends on, on, on the private practitioners and the doctors and the medical practitioners in the, in the, in the field to educate the patients right now. Because we can't, which in all fairness, we can't look to the government to do anything other than what they are doing now in the whole COVID prevention right now. No, man. I mean, no, I understand. I understand that COVID is the, is the priority right now, but mm -hmm. it is something for us to ponder on. Oh, and and I, think, I, think, I think you and I, you and I are going to have another conversation just focused on HPV. I think it might be necessary that just for my understanding, and I'm sure a lot of persons will, will appreciate it as well. Um, so I really thank you in advance for that. No problem. No problem. I mean, <laughs> once it has to HPV, you can call me in. That is yes, my, that's absolutely. my, I, that is something that's very dear to my heart. Very, very absolutely. dear to my heart. Absolutely. Well, I want to say big up yourself and thank you very much. You have, you have shone a lot of light in, in a lot of darkness. And um, I don't see any questions on the live. Let me just review. Uh, some persons wanted to ask, I think somebody asked earlier about genital warts. 
-hmm. They were asking um, about contagious or contagious it is it. Um, isn't that one of those things that is a skin to skin transmission? HPV. So genital warts are caused by HPV. So That's whether the warts are present or not, and, and it's a different type of HPV that mm -hmm. that war gives it the, the genital warts, the 45, the 33s. Right, but um, it's the same HPV can cause cancer of the cervix as well. But some right. men get warts, some men get warts, some don't. It just one of those okay. things you don't understand. You know, some people get it, some people don't. But it's very contagious, and it's mm. a virus. It's very, very contagious. Very, very contagious. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Here comes the countdown from Instagram. Thank you very much, Doctor Darrell. Pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. Sure. And Any time. seconds and big up yourself. We're going to be in touch. We're going to do this again. We're going to talk about HPV. People tune in and lock in and share with their friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Daryl, go on and take a shower and relax yourself. You came off the road to talk to us. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> take care.